Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. This is part two of my interview with convicted murderer and Tennessee death row inmate Stephen Wiggins. I, yeah, I remember thinking to myself, he's going to shoot me if he sees his pistol. And I wouldn't eat, like, I don't, it happened so fast. I don't even know what my thought process was. But I just grabbed the pistol, and I remember Erica was leaning forward, putting her hair up. And I felt my hand smack her in the face, and it knocked her head back. And when her head went back, I just squeezed the trigger. I can't even tell you how many times. And I was like, I got to run now. I ducked the door open, and I went to take off running, and I looked back, and he was laying on the ground. And he was coughing, like, he was coughing up blood. And... I was like, oh, shit. And I just went in, like, automatic mode. I don't... It just... I I don't know. Something else... Another part of me just took over. I, I, could, I didn't even remember what all had happened in detail until I saw the video... I loaded it, I I run up and got his car and pulled it back to where he was. And when I looked up, Erica was running as fast as she could away. And I was like, well, I'm booked. And I put him in the car. And I go to take off, but I'm facing the opposite direction of where I want to go. So I go down the road and I turn around and I come back up and I look for Erica to see if I can see her. And she's nowhere to be found. So I turn to go out the main road and as I go up the little hill coming up from the stop sign right there, his backup comes over the hill. And I don't know, I just waved at him. And he waved back. I, I pulled about another 20 feet and I hit the brakes. I'm like, what do I do? I stopped. And he stopped. I was like, fuck it, I gotta go. And I just took off. And I was going down the road and I was like, what the fuck do I do? What the fuck do I go? And I saw a little side road. I cut off on it. And... I think there was a dead end sign. And I I thought to myself, well, I'm fucked now. I'm in a dead end. And I looked to the left, and there was a barbed wire fence in a field. And I just jerked a wheel and cut through that barbed wire fence off into the middle of that field. And whenever I got down in the field, like, where I knew I couldn't be seen, I stopped, and there was a bottle of water sitting in the console, and I hit another big shot, and I was, I just, I was like, I got to destroy everything. So I started going through the truck, finding what I could, what I thought would be necessity to take with me. And I remember I I was trying to find his keys because I was going to take his rifle, his automatic rifle. And I reached around him, 
and I pulled his pistol out of the holster. I was like, okay, I need this. And I I was so high, I lost it. They, uh, I think my lawyer said they found it under the hood of the truck. Because next thing I thought was, this truck has GPS. I got to find it. So I popped the hood, and I was looking on it for a GPS box. And I thought about a plumbing company that I used to work for. They had uh, GPS chips that plugged in the diagnostic port underneath the dash. So I looked, and sure enough, there was a GPS chip plugged in the diagnostic port. I pulled it. And there was a like a not really, kind of like a canvas duffel bag, laptop bag, something like that. And I got to go through it, see what was in it, and there was a pocket knife. There was a knife in it. I was like, I need a knife. Put it in my pocket because I had actually dropped mine. Whenever I went to fix my shot of dope, I dropped my knife and it went down between the seat and I couldn't get it. So I was like, I need not put it in my pocket. And I got to looking around and see what I could find and I looked in the door and there was this little mini pink lighter. And whenever I saw it, I was like, I got to burn this motherfucker. So I grabbed the lighter and I grabbed papers out of suitcase and shoved them down in between the seats and I opened the back door and I shoved papers down under him and I lit everything on fire and I struck out and I cut across a couple of fields through a patch of woods and I come out to a creek with a little bridge there And I heard cars flying down the road. I was like, oh, shit. So I duck up under the bridge. And, like, I peek around the edge of it, and I see SUVs, like three or four of them, just across that bridge as fast as they could. And I had the bottle of water and everything. I was like, fuck. And I made up another big shot of dope, and I hit it. And I come out, went up on top of the bridge, and cut across the road, cut across the field. There was another road. I went across it, and there was like a big bank that went up it, probably 15, 20 feet, with trees growing all up it. And I could hear vehicles tearing down the road. And... I climbed up that bank as fast as I could. I remember there was a barbed wire fence at the top of it. And I went across the barbed wire fence, and my pants hung on the fence. So as I tried to come jump off of it, my leg caught. And I just hit my back flat on the ground with my legs stuck straight up in the air. And I looked down the bank, and I watched cop SUVs come flying by. And I run about halfway across this big field. And there was a tree. There was a creek that cut through the middle of the field. And there was this big tree that fell over. And, like, the root ball of it was sticking out over the edge of the creek bank. And I could hear more vehicles coming. So I jump in the creek. And I actually go under the water and swim up underneath the root ball between the root ball and the bank. And I was like, I, I was, I was like, what the fuck do I do now? I'm like, fuck it, I'm gonna blow my heart up. So I start just, I'm sucking up creek water. I just making shots of dope so thick that the syringes will barely suck them up anymore. And I would do shots. 
and I would come to and I would be underwater where where they pat where they knock me out. And I would come back up and catch my breath and feel around underneath me till I found my gun. And I did that for two or three days. And I could there was I could hear helicopters above me. I actually heard police radios walking on the bank above me. Yeah, I was I I was just I was there, you know what I mean? And it was it I knew it was early one morning. I didn't know how many days I'd been there. And I hadn't ate in probably 20 days. I'd been up for 20 days. And I thought, I better go find something to eat. So I'll take bricks of dough and I break them, like I cut them open and everything and drop them down in the creek to get rid of them. I come out, climb up the bank, cross the rest of the field, and cross this uh, big metal gate. Uh, I'm out in the middle of the country, so I'm thinking there's a garden, there's something. i got to find something to eat. And I was walking down the road, and I didn't make it far. And I think I had, I remember I was feeling dizzy and my legs were so weak and tired I could barely walk. And I got off to the side of the road in the tall grass and sat down and I think I seized out. Because whenever I come to, there was a state trooper SUV parked at me. And they arrested me. Do you remember what that arrest was like? The arrest? Yeah. Did you say the arrest? Yeah. Do you remember what it was like when you were arrested with all the cops and everybody around? Uh, It was two state troopers. And one ride. Saw him come around the back of the car. I thought, I, I didn't know where my backpack was, but the guns was in the backpack. And I figured, you know, I was a dead or alive take in at that point. So I figured I'd better cooperate so I didn't have any weapons and try to go peacefully. Uh... I do remember, like, I passed out in the back of the cop car, and I woke up, and they were driving me around the parking lot that was full of police. And then they stopped, and they opened the door, and a bunch of them was looking at me, and I think they was taking pictures and shit. And I remember they closed the door back. Whenever they closed the door back, my leg had went between the seat and the door. So I started hollering at them that my leg was stuck. And they finally opened the door and let me fix my leg. And then they took me to the hospital. And I got to the hospital and they made me take off my clothes. And I remember I hit the bed and I was gone. I don't even know how many days I was in the hospital. Do you remember what it was like when you did get out of the hospital when they took you to jail? Uh, yeah, they put me, uh, state troopers took me. Since state troopers found me, they was always in charge of my transport. And, uh, see, they took me, I think they took me to Dixon County Jail. No, they took me to Nashville Jail and actually booked me. And 
they put me they put me on suicide watch at MCC Davidson County MCC and I was on suicide watch for hell a month but like the first few days I didn't really comprehend where I was at. You know what I mean? And I had so much dope pushing out of my body, out of my skin, that they thought I had scabies. So they was treating me for scabies just in case I had it. But what it was was where all the meth was pushing out of my body. Uh, my federal lawyers actually did a hair follicle test on me within like the first two weeks. And they they did it on video. They showed them cutting all my hair and all that stuff, and they thinned it off. It come back from the lab that I had so much meth in my system that they can't even test that high of an amount. While you were on trial, were you offered any type of plea deals? Uh, no. I, I had, my only option was a death penalty trial. Do you remember what the trial was like the entire time? Uh, man, what it was difficult. Just, listening to what other people had to say about me and knowing that I'm not really that person and having to watch the body cam video knowing his family was watching it too. Did you interact with his family at all uh, throughout your court proceedings? Uh, no. Uh, they, uh, his wife at my trial in Dixon read her victim impact statement. And how did that make you feel at the time after you heard it? Man, it made me feel smaller than a pissing. My, my lawyers actually advised me against me. You have one minute remaining. Well, my lawyers actually advised me against testifying on my own behalf in court. Do you regret not testifying? Yeah. They told me not to say nothing. Can you talk about what your experience was like every time you did go to court? I know Erica, in our previous interview, she said that they had used uh, Sergeant Baker's cuffs on you uh, every uh, time you went to yeah. trial. Is that true? Yes, they used uh, Sergeant Baker's handcuffs on me. They had him inscribed with his name and uh, I think his car number and uh, the scripture, peace be to, or uh, blessed be the peacekeepers. So, after you were convicted and received a both federal life sentence without parole and a state death sentence, what was your reaction? Really, I knew it was coming. It wasn't a major surprise. I had five years pre-trial to, to know what was going to happen on the day of my trial. So, do you remember what it was like on your way to death row after you were convicted and sentenced, uh, whether it was on a bus or in a van or whatever? Uh, I was brought in a uh, in a new blacked out SUV with Sergeant Baker's car number on it, directly from court to River Bend, and. I got here and they turned me over to the custody of the prison here. They uh they changed me out. 
and brought me over to Unit 2 Death Row. Uh, when I first got here, uh, there was uh, some some ex-cops from Dixon County that worked here. And they had them convinced that I was going to be a big-time troublemaker and all this shit. So they put me in a cell behind a special pie flat, which is, it, it's got a sliding door, and it's got like a, Try to build out front of it with a lid that closes on it. Uh, I stayed in my cell for like a day, and then they made me go to the infirmary and be put on suicide watch for two weeks. I was not suicidal. What is suicide watch like uh, on death row? Like, what do you have to do? What can you not do? Uh, well, they don't keep you on death row and put you on suicide watch. They take you to the infirmary on what they call short haul. And uh, when you're on suicide watch, you you don't get nothing but a mat, and they give you a... Uh, it's like a quilted green schmock that's Velcro. Which I'm like way too big for those, so. <laughs> that's one thing I've never got about. Uh, correctional facilities and suicide watch. They strip you down to the most miserable point that you can be and expect you to suddenly not decide to kill yourself if you are suicidal. And how how long did you spend on suicide watch before they let you back into uh, the cell? Two weeks. So so there's like nothing in there, right? Like no TV, no radio, no no no, uh, no it, it's just. It's a concrete slab and a shower head that sticks out of the wall and a toilet in the sink. And your monitor 24-7, right? Yeah. So nowadays, how do you spend your time on death row? Uh, currently, I have been knocked back down to a sea level. So I'm locked down in my cell except to come out for rec or to go to programs. And uh, I, I, I've, I'm i actually doing a, an education for ministry study. It's the actual college course, theological course from uh, Swanee College that a church got together and paid tuition for 12 people here to take the class and bought all of our books for it and everything. Uh, I write letters. I talk on the phone. I watch TV. I listen to music. Read books. Six years later, do you have remorse? for the killing of, for the shooting of Sergeant Baker? Well, of course. I mean, I've done a lot of bad things in my life, but it was mostly to bad people. You know what I mean? But this was an innocent man. My lawyers are trying to talk me into uh, filing motions for a new trial, for, you know, trying to get off death row, and I, I don't want to put his family back to another trial. I don't want them to have to sit in a courtroom and watch that video again.
one of the biggest things that bother me about being on death row is the motivation for premeditation come from a guy named Brian Hudnall. And he used Daniel Baker's misfortune for his own personal gain to get out of a jail sentence and to get a deal. He violated, he had a five year community corrections violation. And in November of 2018, whenever they was talking about putting his sentence into effect, he suddenly wrote a message on the kiosk. I, my lawyer showed it to me. I said, I need to talk to detectives. I have information about the Stephen Wiggins case. And he's used this event to keep himself from going to prison. So looking back now, do you think there's anything that you or Erica could have done to prevent the murder of Sergeant Daniel Baker? Erica, no, because she didn't have a clue that anything was going to happen. You know what I mean? She she did not have part in killing Daniel Baker. I can't say her actions after she ran away, but her personally having involvement in it happening, none whatsoever. I I didn't even know I was going to kill him. I didn't know I'd shot him until I got out of the car and he was laying on the ground. So she didn't have any clue that anything was about to even happen. Can you think of anything that could have prevented the crime from happening in the first place? Yeah, probably if I would have been high on my mind and just in that mentality of what being a drug dealer puts you into, you know what I mean? And not putting myself back out there in that situation to begin with to where I, I didn't have a gun to hurt nobody. I had a gun because I run around with large amounts of dope, and people will do anything to get it. You know what I mean? How does prison politics work on Tennessee's death row when it comes to using the phone, showers, etc.? Uh, well, in a pod on death row, showers are in the cell. In B pod, there's three communion showers. And uh, A levels, you're allowed to move about all day freely, uh, except for lockdown time, which is 11, 12, and 4, 5. And then we lock down every night at 8.30. But other than that, you're pretty much free to move around as long as you're A-level. Uh, we got our own kitchen here. Uh, we get, for people's birthdays and stuff, we come together and make pizzas and we get burritos and uh, we have our own laundry here on the unit, so we wash our own clothes. Uh, everybody try, uh, if somebody here is hungry, somebody is going to give them something to eat and they don't expect nothing back. We 
don't have gang violence. We don't have overdoses. Most of the people here have been here for 20 years together. And they've come together in one unity of trying to save their lives. Is there anything that you would like the public to know about yourself or this case? Uh, this was a horrible tragedy against a good person. And I know people out there are struggling with mental health and drug addiction. And a lot of the people that I've come in contact since this has happened, I try to help them change their lives. I try to encourage them to seek help and to stop doing drugs and to be productive members of society. Uh, I've actually got a few people off of drugs since I've been locked up because I started up telling them, look, this is where the fuck you're going to wind up. So do what you got to do to straighten out your life. If if something could come of this, I would like there to be some kind of program established for people with mental health problems and drug problems to get help to prevent things like this from happening. I, on the streets, I try to go get mental health help, but when I can't pass a drug test, they say, we can't help you. So I turn to drugs. You said you tried to get mental health help. Have you been diagnosed with any mental illnesses? I've been diagnosed schizophrenic, PTSD, and compulsive brain disorder since I was nine years old. Do you hear voices or see anything that's not there? Uh, I constantly see things moving around me. And I hear voices. I can have full-blown conversations with myself. I can literally play a four-person game of spades and not know what's in each person's hand. Were you hearing voices the day of the shooting of uh, Sergeant Baker? I, I've never stopped hearing voices. And the higher I get, the worse things get. Like, what would the voices say or tell you to do when you did get high and when it did get worse? Uh, my, my alias, people call me Frisco Kid because the most dominant voice in my head is actually a Latino man. He speaks Spanish. I don't know Spanish. Never took Spanish, but I can repeat what he says to me to a, a Hispanic person and have a full blown conversation and know what the hell not know what the hell they're saying. But he he also speaks, you know, like mixed English and you know it's it's hard to describe because it, it's like its own type of speech, you know what I mean? Right. There might be, out of a ten-word sentence, there might be six words that's English and four words that's Spanish.
So do you think there are any misconceptions about you in the media? I'm not just a horrible person in my life. You know what I mean? I've done bad things, yes. I, I've done horrible things that I will regret for the rest of my life. But I'm also a father. And I put the well-being of my child and teaching him good moral and good ethic and respect above anything. You know what I mean? Right. Me and him's just now got back to a good standing relationship to where he's starting to confide in me again. And... We finally can start joking about things, and he's he's going to be a teenager next month, and so he's going through body changes, and I aggravate him about things, and we watch silly shows on TV together on the same channel while we're on the phone, and make fun of what's going on on the TV. We find songs that that make us think about each other, and you know listen to them together, and things like it. So, before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered yet? out there and you're listening this and you're in that state of life where you're on drugs and you're selling drugs and you're living that kind of lifestyle and being the person that you have to be to successfully do that change because it's not worth it. All the money in the world ain't going to give you back your freedom and life to spend with your children. That was part two of my interview with Stephen Wiggins. For extra content, ad-free episodes, and more, head on over to patreon.com slash unforbidden truth. Thank you for listening. See you on the next one. Unforbidden.